A very warm welcome everyone to this, the last in the current series of Wonka webinars. Today the topic is research and will be led by Professor Felicity Goodyear-Smith, who chairs Wonka's working party on research. As usual, we have a great panel of experts who will be introduced to you as we go along. But we particularly welcome two past presidents of Wonka, Professor Chris Van Veel and Professor Michael Kidd. As ever, we will also be monitoring your questions and comments, and Anna Stavdal, our president-elect, will be putting some of these to the panelists. But before that, I'd like to hand over to Anna for some introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Carth. Um, it's my privilege to greet you all on behalf of our president, Donald Lee, who will join us later. I will now convey his opening remarks. He says, good day. Welcome to the eighth Wonka webinar. Thank you, family doctors, for sharing the burden of dealing with this COVID-19 global epidemic. Family doctors are continuing with their massively increased workload, but I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. Family doctors all around the world disseminate scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages and professional support through their social media links and connections. The Wonka webinar is a platform for all of you to share experiences, relay information and to keep in touch with each other regularly, like family members, urging courage and offering mutual support in these extraordinary times. Next slide, please. To provide essential evidence for informed clinical and health policy decision making, research is essential. Indeed, one of the objectives of the Wonka Working Party on Research is to support countries and regions in the promotion and nurturing of family medicine, general practice, primary health care research in their respective nations with the timely translation of its results into everyday clinical service. Today, we have a panel of renowned experts who will share with us some of the studies on COVID-19 as well as other research activities of the working group. So with these words from Donald, we are good to go. I will be moderating the discussion, as Garth said, after each presentation. So please post your questions, share observations and comments, and I will do my best to convey some of them to our panelists. Let me now Welcome the chair of the Wonka Working Party on Research, Felicity Goodyear-Smith. We are looking forward to your introduction, Felicity, and the screen is all yours. Oh, thank you very much, Anna. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. And so welcome to this Wonka webinar hosted by the Working Party on Research. I'd like to thank our President Donald Lee and President-elect Anna Stabdol for organising this whole webinar series and also our CEO Garth Manning and especially CEO-elect um, Harris Legardis who um, for all his IT support. So as Anna said I'm Felicity Goodyear-Smith the chair of the Working Party on Research and we're going to address a number of different issues in this webinar but mostly they're around research projects that members of the Working Party have really quickly instigated since the outbreak of COVID-19. And they're looking both at the primary care response uh, to, the, to the pandemic, but also how primary care has been affected by the pandemic. We're also going to cover briefly some of the other activities our group's involved with. In particular, Wonka's role as the founding member of the International Primary Care Research Consortium and also our new book which we're editing in collaboration with the Working Party on Education. This is a guide to primary, primary care educational research and this will be a companion to our two books, The International Perspectives of Primary Care Research and How to Do Primary Care Research, which you can see on the screen there. We have a panel from around the world to cover some of these issues. 
And as Anna said, there's an opportunity to ask questions using the chat uh, function on Zoom. Um, and Anna will be posing the questions to our presenters after each presentation. So I'd just firstly like to introduce our panel to you. First, we have Bob Phillips and Andrew Bazemore, who are family physicians from the United States. And they've been involved in research and policy for many years. But Bob's a director of the Center of Professionalism and Value of Healthcare, and, and Andrew is the vice president of the research and policy, both at the Family Board of American Board of Family Medicine. Now they're going to give us some early findings of our international primary care survey. Next, we have Michael Kidd, a previous president of Wonka and now deputy chief medical officer in Australia, who's going to tell us about some of the action research and learnings from the primary health care response to COVID in Australia. I'm going to then briefly describe a primary care research project taking place in the US, Canada, and now in Australia and New Zealand, uh, which is monitoring the effect of the pandemic on primary care practice. Another president of Wonka, Chris Van Wiel, will tell us about how primary care presentations have changed uh, in the Netherlands since the advent of COVID-19. And next will come Bob Mash, who's a family doctor and chair of family medicine at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, uh, South Africa. Uh, Bob's also the coordinator of the Sub-Saharan uh, uh, African Pr Primafamid Network, and he's now the founding chair of the International Primary Healthcare Research Consortium, which he's going to tell you about. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Minmet Ekman from Istanbul, Turkey. Minmet's head of the family medicine at Marmara University. He's also working on the front line dealing with COVID cases in his city. Minmet will be the incoming chair of our working party. We were planning a handover when we meet at Wonka World in Abu Dhabi in November. However, I come from New Zealand, where we are in the enviable place of almost certainly having eradicated COVID-19 from our country. The downside of this is that international travel is unlikely until there's a vaccine. So sadly, I can't see me traveling to the Wonka World Conference this year. So I'd like to pass on uh, over now to our presenters. And first I'd like to invite Bob and Andrew to tell us some hot off the press, very early findings from our Wonka endorsed international primary care survey. Thank you. Thank you, Felicity. And Harris, do you mind pulling up the first slide? Thank you. So this study was, uh, as, as many studies from Wonka are hatched uh, by Professor Felicity Goodyear Smith um, with considerable contribution by Dr. Karen Kinder. Um, besides Andrew and myself, we were also joined by Christina Manny and Stefan Stridham from South Africa, who have uh, shouldered an amazing amount of the data collection and processing and analysis of uh, the findings. But this uh, incredibly robust study that was fielded in both English and Spanish and the Spanish translation supported by uh, Dr. Juan Ramirez from Mexico, with support from Viviana Bianca, uh, Martinez Bianca uh, from the United States, uh, drew uh, a lot of responses as you'll see in just one moment. Next slide, please. Uh, it helped having endorsements from all around the world and getting this fielded. And we're grateful for the various organizations and particularly Wonka for supporting it. Next slide, please. We, the, the survey itself had 34 questions uh, that uh, we're really aiming at looking at capturing the strength of primary health care as well as uh, country responses. And then those were compared to outcomes by country, uh, particularly looking at the acceleration of uh, the rate of deaths from COVID-19. Uh, but a number of the questions were really trying to capture uh, how the countries responded with uh, policies such as blocking entry in countries, uh, including things like border control, quarantine, and uh, testing of new arrivals. 
The second was really looking at reducing the spread and what was the response of the country and trying to address that. Uh, was it shelter in place? Was it contact tracing? And, and specifically within this, looking at the variety of ways that primary care and public health, that uh, primary health care was involved in that. And then looking at how they manage severe cases and really focusing on the acute wave of COVID-19 uh, illness, including hospitalizations and getting particular things in place in order to handle that surge. Next slide, please. The public health and primary care responses were of particular interest from very simple things like hygiene measures uh, and particularly having enough personal protective equipment for primary care. Uh, the second was its role in looking at person-to-person -person contact. Uh, while some of those are public policies like physical distancing and, and banning mass gatherings, it was also looking at how primary care responded to work remotely, how they kept their more vulnerable patients away, um, and how the population and primary care are involved in self-isolation and, and shutdown. Uh, we also looked at some of the impact on the primary care uh, infrastructure. And as Felicity said, there's been a much larger focus on trying to assess that through a separate mechanism now. And then lastly, that critical role of identifying cases and, and the role of primary care in, in doing testing and contact tracing or surveillance, or was it really more of a public health function or was there some evidence of collaboration? Next slide, please. So again, the aim was really to examine the country's characteristics and strategies in dealing with the pandemic from a primary health care perspective and determine if there was any measurable impact on outcomes. So looking at what factors might correlate with the rate of death and what lessons might be learned to better address this in future pandemics. And our method was fairly straightforward. It was primary health care clinicians, researchers, and policymakers who were asked to identify themselves in one or more roles. As I said, it was in English and in Spanish. It was disseminated via the primary health care networks and really took advantage of snowballing to make sure it reached every country that we could. And as I said, the questions address the nature of the primary health care system in each country, how it responded to the pandemic, the use of health information technology, particularly with telehealth, and whether their country had a pandemic plan. Uh, and I should say within that, whether primary health care had a role in that pandemic plan. And then also various strategies employed in response to the pandemic to try and get a sense of uh, how countries may have differentially responded. Next slide, please. So we had uh, participants survey data around country level and primary healthcare pandemic responses. We used the maximum death rate on a seven day moving average basis as a response variable. And we used participants narratives. We actually captured some qualitative data that was quite fascinating. Uh, the analyses were particularly univariate um, as, as will be in a upcoming paper, uh, followed by probably a second paper looking at bivariate and regression model analyses in the thematic analysis, uh, trying to figure out what could be learned from those responses. Overall, we had 1,131 responses from 114 countries. Um, they included low income, middle income, and high income countries, all world regions. We had uh, the highest response rate from Australia, and we had 34 countries with a single respondent from each. Uh, the top five with more than 50 responses were Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Malaysia, and the United States. Almost three quarters were primary care clinicians. It's fascinating. We had so many frontline primary care clinicians, 17% academics, 6% policymakers, and 4% who were other. 92% uh, of the surveys were completed by uh, English, of the English version, and 8% were completed in Spanish. Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Bob. And as Felicity and Bob know, this is a work in progress. We have been um, deeply grateful to Wonka and many other networks for generating the kind of response that we received. 
with 1,131 responses from 114 countries, including open field and, uh, and text entries, we are just getting started in understanding the meaning from our survey. We can say that we still have holes in our knowledge of a truly multi, a truly, again, uh, unifying understanding of how primary health care and country level responses to the pandemic have gone. Uh, but you can see from this map that you have reasonable coverage across regions, lower income countries, middle income countries, and high income countries, as Bob noted. I'll go ahead and go to the next slide, though. Our preliminary results are mostly bivariate. Uh, we are looking for early correlations and trying to get uh, really an understanding of the highest respondent countries to date. And it's fairly clear that two key areas, testing and movement restrictions, are highly correlated with lower death rates. A, I think this is not surprising to many that uh, death rates would be less where testing was readily available at the time of the first COVID death, where you had testing on incoming travelers um, on migration where you had testing conducted for those who actually had a symptom uh, consistent with COVID-19, and for anyone who was exposed to a COVID-19 positive individual. We also found strong correlations between death rates and physical distancing, event closures, closures of all but essential services, isolation that was based on contact tracing, self-isolation in households, and quarantine for suspected cases. Less clear was the correlation with what we would uh, have put together as an aggregate measure of a strong primary health care system. Um, we did not find strong correlation between death rates and being, uh, you know, again, um, I rated as strong in primary health care, but we are, are finding interesting patterns nonetheless uh, within our data. Uh, speaking as uh, someone coming from the United States, when you look at the um, higher income countries that are English speaking, there was a very clear correlation uh, between strong primary health care and a lower mortality rate. The scatter of high mortality, strong primary health care, low mortality, less strong primary health care, and the two opposite quadrants are going to be interesting areas to study going forward. And we really anticipate some of the richness of our analyses coming out of case studies, uh, understanding a match between these primary care frontline perspectives, what we can objectively obtain uh, from literature and uh, web searches, as well as ongoing interviews. We also anticipate doing multivariate analysis and trying to understand where these various elements that might predict death uh, intersect once we get past the early bivariate understandings. And with that, I know we are at time, but please anticipate much more work to come and reporting to come out of this study. And we really are grateful again to Wonka for both helping us to gather all these responses, to spread the word on the study, and eventually to help with the dissemination of its outcomes. And I'll turn it back over to Felicity. I think, I think actually you're, you're handing over to me. <laughs> oh, forgive me, Diana. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for, this is, I th think actually I know one of the respondents <laughs> in this survey. <laughs> Come to think of it. Um, well, I'm um, on the chat just to, to inform you about that. People are warming up, I think. So, so attendees uh, around the world, please post questions and comments. There are none so far, and we're used to them coming, warming up a little bit, and there will be more in the time to come. Um, I, I wonder, I have a question to you. Um, personal protective equipment has been a hot issue, still is for healthcare workers and also uh, as a hygienic measure to, to prevent spread of the virus. Was that at all something you looked into when you, when you created the, the survey? And um, that is one question. We can start with that. Uh, Anna, thank you for that question. It sure was. Uh, uh, the questions, you know, ranged from availability and and um, and both generally and for primary care specifically. Um, the survey work that uh, Felicity mentioned now across more than five countries uh, is looking even more specifically at that issue for primary care. Uh, but for example, in the United States, there was almost no prioritization of 
of PPE to primary care uh, still, it's still a, a raging problem for primary care. It's improving, but um, most of it was dedicated to hospitals and to first responders. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it turns out to be a struggle everywhere, but in particular countries, it, it really depended on the role of primary care in the response to the pandemic. Mm. To me, I mean, we're, we're a global organization. And when I look at the discussions uh, on this specific issue around the world, how much is evidence-based, I mean, the advices and policies worked out, and how much is culture? And what does it really mean? It's an, just, just an input from me. I mean, it would be interesting to, to, to have a look at, also from a research um, viewpoint. Anyone who wants to? Uh, comment on that. Any of you on the panel? No, <laughs> not now. <laughs> Bob, I'm looking at you. You're smiling, but we'll we'll leave it there. Um, our next presenter is Michael Kidd. He will update us about the work he and his team has been doing in Australia. Michael, it's great to have you here again, back again, uh, as one of our past Wonka presidents. So the screen is all yours. Great. Thank you, Anna. And um, <clears throat> Harris, if we can have the first slide, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you a little bit about is about the work that we've been doing in Australia. And I've come back to Australia from Canada to take up this role as Deputy Chief Medical Officer, where uh, I'm responsible for the rollout of the National Primary Care COVID-19 response. And I want to tell you about some of the research which has been informing that rollout, but also the action research which we have uh, underway. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Harris. This is just an update on what's been happening with the uh, pandemic uh, in Australia. Uh, and as you can see, like in many countries, we had an initial large uh, number of infections and then the country went into lockdown uh, the, uh, the infections have rapidly reduced and uh, with the lifting of restrictions which started about three weeks ago uh, we still uh, maintain very low levels of uh, new infections uh, we've had just over 100 deaths uh, in Australia and uh, and fortunately we didn't have uh, overwhelming of our hospital system uh, move to the next slide uh, this is what's been happening in primary care and in, in primary care in Australia we moved very rapidly to adopt uh, telehealth as being uh, which was funded uh, by the government uh, to allow the entire population to link with their family doctor and other uh, health care providers uh, particularly as we went into the lockdown phase we established a large number of general practice or family doctor led respiratory clinics which uh, moved the uh, assessment and management of COVID-19 away from regular general practice settings and they've been established in metropolitan and rural and remote areas right across Australia as you can see uh, on the map. Uh, the next slide. Thank you. So in part of uh, developing the, the National Primary Care Plan, we looked at the evidence of what had happened in past epidemics and pandemics around the world, looked at the role of uh, family medicine found that in many countries, uh, family medicine had been left out of pandemic responses and, uh, and then looked at the roles that uh, we expected that family medicine in Australia was going to play uh, as uh, the pandemic uh, started uh, to come into the country. And these were the, the four principles that we based our national plan on, again, based on the evidence from uh, past pandemics. Firstly, recognising that family doctors and family medicine was most likely to be involved in protecting the most vulnerable people in each community, which of course includes uh, the elderly, uh, people with chronic disease, uh, people with immune suppression. Secondly, that it was really important to preserve the functional capacity of family medicine and primary care to ensure that we'd have ongoing healthcare provision for all conditions. And uh, the evidence from past epidemics uh, showing that often more people uh, died as a result of having lack of access to healthcare from other conditions than died from the infectious agent. So very important that we uh, kept the, uh, the functions of family medicine going. 
Uh, thirdly, recognising that most people, given that most people with COVID-19 have uh, mild to moderate symptoms and don't actually require hospitalisation, that these people would be cared for by family doctors and other members of the primary care team in their own homes or in residential aged care facilities. And so the importance of being able to support our family doctors to do that. And finally, the principle that people working in primary care and family medicine required access to personal protective equipment, just like people working in hospitals. And that the people working in family medicine weren't just there as a source of workforce to boost what was happening in hospitals. We needed our family doctors working in the community and, uh, and providing the care that they, uh, that they provide. And so this was the basis of Australia's national primary care plan based on the research of what had happened before. And the Australian government allocated 1.5 billion Australian dollars to the national primary care plan. It's about a billion US dollars uh, just to the uh, family medicine uh, components uh, of the national plan against COVID-19. Just move to the next slide, please, Harris. So part of my work, uh, working as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer responsible for this work, uh, I had an act, I've got, or I have an action research team working alongside me, documenting what we're actually doing. And so uh, recording uh, what's happening as part of the primary care response in Australia. Uh, and so we have this evidence base that we're building up that we can use in the future uh, and help us to be even better prepared when future pandemics and national emergencies occur. Uh, part of the, the work of the action research team has been uh, documenting the collaborative work that we've been doing with stakeholders, particularly the professional organisations, including the Wonka member organisations in Australia, the two colleges, uh, to work together on uh, on highlighting and getting feedback on the emerging issues which are affecting uh, the healthcare of the uh, the people of our country, uh, and also uh, building up an evidence base uh, from the literature, uh, specifically targeted to address the different areas which we've been looking at as the pandemic rolls out. And, uh, and also having the action research team there available to do very rapid reviews. And we've uh, had the team doing reviews on guidelines on the use of PPE, advice on the widespread use of masks, both by healthcare workers in the community and a number of other areas. Uh, next slide, please, Harris. And this is the final slide, which just shows some of the, uh, the papers which have been developed by uh, the action research team that I have working alongside me. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of publications already on uh, the Australian primary care response. Uh, we have conducted a number of rapid reviews, as I've mentioned, which are uh, under uh, review or have been accepted for publication. We've looked particularly at occupational health and particularly concerns about healthcare workers uh, attending um, work when they have symptoms which could indicate COVID-19. Uh, and this has been particularly a concern in residential aged care facilities and, uh, and concerns when people uh, are casual workers and if they don't turn up for work, they don't get paid. Uh, and the, uh, the perverse incentive for people to actually to continue working even when they may have symptoms, which is very concerning. Uh, and also um, a paper we've written on uh, as industry and business uh, start to uh, reactivate uh, in Australia and the economy starts to get moving again and the healthcare implications are uh, under the new normal for those businesses. Uh, uh, research into uh, telehealth and the uh, implementation and how that's gone and who's missing out in the population on getting access to the benefits of telehealth from their chosen providers and then lessons from primary care from previous pandemics which we hope will help in the future, as well as a focus on mental health and a focus on what's been happening in rural areas around the country. Uh, so Anna, that's the, uh, that's the outline of, uh, of what we've been doing and happy to field any questions if we have any. Thank you. I have a question for you, Michael. <laughs> and um, it's about you, one of your last points on, on telehealth. Um, many countries, have experienced, or many, many countries, the majority of countries maybe have experienced a revolution almost overnight. Um, and you, you asked the question, who's missing out? Um, who's gaining from it and uh, who's not? 
what what is your plan now in in your role to to assess this and um, evaluate because i think this is extremely important and now is is the time to do it yeah that's no, a great question thanks anna and we're looking at this really seriously um, when i came to australia part of my new role was going to be uh, a 10-year primary health care uh, reform package of which moving uh, to virtual care was going to be part of that 10-year plan instead we implemented the virtual care in 10 days rather than in 10 years uh, and, uh, and that rolled out uh, initially to vulnerable people who needed to stay at home, then to vulnerable healthcare practitioners so that they could be working uh, from home and be safe, and then to the entire population. And, uh, and that's running now, we'll be running for a six month program uh, funded uh, with consultations funded by uh, the government. And then at the end of six months, uh, looking to see uh, what we keep and what we don't. And of course, this will depend on what's happening with the uh, pandemic uh, in Australia, but also uh, with what's been working well and what uh, hasn't been working uh, well. So there's uh, considerable work underway and we've got a, uh, a program of research uh, looking at, uh, uh, at how that's happened and then looking at what might happen next. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. I have a slight problem with my connection here, but you still hear me? You can just nod if you hear me up. <laughs> Good. Um, there, there is an overlay from, from, from Lot's presentation, but this goes to, to all panelists. And I think it's really of, of, um, of interest to, to many of us. To the testing and to the really nitty gritty thing of, of testing and, and tracing. False negative tests and lack of contact tracing has also been attributing to spread. How come testing helped so much? I post it to you now, Michael, uh, and if anyone here grabs, <laughs> grabs the microphone, you're, you're, yeah, maybe you will start. Yeah, I'm very, very happy to. So uh, the Australian response uh, now is built around uh, three, uh, three things. Uh, testing uh, everybody uh, who has symptoms, which could be uh, COVID-19. Uh, contact tracing uh, and following up with any contacts of, of people who've been infected. And we also have, uh, as many countries do, an app which we're encouraging people to download uh, on their phones, which... Uh, uh, records uh, anyone who you've been in close contact uh, with over the preceding uh, two to three weeks uh, and that's being used by the contact tracers and then the third feature is being able to move in very quickly when we do get outbreaks and of course we do expect uh, to continue to have outbreaks occurring and uh, and to be able to very rapidly uh, move people into isolation into quarantine close down facilities uh, carry out the testing and then the uh, contact tracing, do the deep cleans of facilities before they reopen. And so this has been happening uh, in schools, it's been happening uh, in businesses, it's been happening uh, where we've, we've had outbreaks uh, occurring in, uh, in homes uh, as well. And, uh, and so this is essential. Uh, the testing, uh, initially Australia, like many countries, we didn't have uh, access to enough tests, so they were rationed. Uh, now uh, we have tests available to everyone with respiratory uh, symptoms and uh, we've performed uh, over 1.4 million tests uh, so far. We also have sentinel testing uh, taking place with uh, high-risk populations and particularly uh, in areas like healthcare workers and residential aged care uh, workers and home care workers for the frail elderly uh, and people with disability and also uh, for people in a number of populations where we're concerned that we may have um, uh, community transmission occurring, but uh, not uh, not picking it up as quickly as we as we should. Uh, so quite uh, quite extensive, and again more research which is underway. We're about to release a report on hidden populations and hidden settings. Uh, we're building on the experience of Singapore, where Singapore had uh, a significant resurgence after thinking everything was under control among uh, foreign workers who were living in dormitory accommodation and. Uh, the infection spread very rapidly amongst that hidden population in Singapore and uh, so we're very keen to look and see which are the populations we should be uh, targeting and testing. Mm. 
Thank you. And, and, and good luck on your work. I'm sure family doctors in Australia are very happy that you took off. It's just because this broke out. But a huge, huge task. So good luck. We're with you. <laughs> um, we are going back to Felicity now. Um, she will give you a very short update on the research project that she's working on with colleagues in the US and Canada and also with Kirsty Douglas, who works with Michael Kidd in Canberra. Please, Felicity. Thank you, Anna. So this is, this is called the, um, the Quick COVID Primary Care Survey, and, um, and the principal investigators are Rebecca Etz, who's in the United States, and Sabrina Wong, who's in Canada, uh, and Christy Douglas, who's in the Australian National University, working um, alongside Michael in some ways um, in Australia, and myself, University of Auckland in New Zealand. Next slide, please, Harris. Uh, and so the original survey was uh, was started by Rebecca. Uh, for, she's in the um, uh, Larry A. Green Centre uh, in the United States, and it's an online survey of primary care doctors, and it takes less than three minutes to complete. So there's four core questions, and then there's between one um, to three one-off questions. They call them flash questions. And these ones are on pressing information needs, so they're different each time. Um, so she started on the 13th of, uh, of March, and they're now on the 11th survey, so they're running it every week. And the aim is to understand the impact of COVID-19 on primary care. And so the things that uh, Bob was mentioning, the things that they, um, they're looking at includes um, the availability of PPE and the availability of testing for primary care. Uh, they're looking at staffing and finance. A number of practices um, in the United States um, have um, had huge financial difficulties uh, and, um, uh, and some of them are having to declare bankruptcy. They just can't keep going. Uh, they, um, when they move to remote consultations, uh, uh, they're unable to uh, be paid for their um, uh, for service for their consultations uh, and they've had to lay off staff and, uh, uh, and get loans or, as I say, go bankrupt. And that, the survey is also looking at the impact on patients with non-COVID-19 conditions. Um, you know, it's so important that, um, that, fam that, that uh, family medicine keeps happening, that uh, people can still get the care they need um, uh, um, when consultations are mostly remote. So next slide, please. So what, what's important about this survey is that um, every week, the findings are very quickly analysed and they're posted and fed back and they're disseminated to the, to the sector, they're disseminated on websites and social media sites, but they're also sent to the media and to policymakers. And recently, um, uh, the um, uh, participants were invited to uh, uh, to give comments that were shared with with the U.S. Congress, and they they're providing as you can as you can see on the right there they're providing um, updates that are really easily as, um, as, uh, able to be assimilated and understood, and uh, uh, each of those series uh, one to eleven each of the each of the um, the findings are very easily accessible on their website but it enables monitoring over time so they can see what's happening. Is it getting better? Are practices now getting enough PPE? Uh, do they have any access to any testing? Uh, are they able to coordinate with public health? So those sort of things uh, and, uh, um, and getting, getting an update every week. Next slide, please. So, um, the next um, uh, that happened was that in Canada, um, Rebecca contacted uh, her colleague Sabrina in Canada, and they started to run the survey. And they've been um, uh, they've been running it um, uh, since the tenth of April. I think they're actually up the fourth, but I think apparently they're now um, up to this their, their sixth survey, um, and and they're doing the similar thing. And again, they're disseminating their findings. And then about two to three weeks ago, um, Rebecca contacted Kirsty and I in, in Australia and New Zealand um, and suggested that um, we might do it in, New Zealand, in our countries too. So we, um, 
very quickly got ethics app applications uh, approved. Uh, and we've just started doing it. So um, our first survey went out on the 22nd of May and it closed on Friday. Uh, we, we, we've just got the first lot of data and we're starting to analyze it. So it's too early to me to give you the results, but in another week we'll have the first, um, uh, the very first findings from the survey and then we'll be running um, a, a, another survey. Uh, we're doing it fortnightly because um, both Australia and New Zealand are, we're, you know, at the moment we're, we're certainly over the hump and, um, you know, we've, you know, uh, we're not in such difficult circumstances as our colleagues uh, in the United States who really need to look at what's happening weekly um, as things keep, uh, keep progressing. So um, each survey is going to form its own country. I mean, in New Zealand, we're... Uh, um, connected to our College of GPs and also the GP, um, GPNZ network of all our PHO uh, providers and they're going to be helping disseminate the information and um, sending it to um, the media and sending it to Ministry of Health and other policy makers. I mean as well as that um, because we're doing these studies in parallel we'll be able to um, uh, do cross-country comparisons and look at what's happening between Australia and New Zealand and between Canada and the US and us as well. So that's just a very early update on an ongoing study. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there is some activity on the chat. Um, some of the reflections are going around uh, financial impact uh, on GPs uh, and you were now speaking about US and um, Bob mentioned something along the same lines. Do you have any any reflections on that? What are we seeing? I mean where, where doctors are paid for pay for service that is the system. Um, how is this in in different countries? Sorry Anna. I mean, even in New Zealand, we you know um, where we haven't had um, uh, the major difficulties that might be being experienced in, this, in the United States. That the lockdown has put incredible pressure on our practices, um, and there've been there've been layoffs of staff, and there've been um, uh, you know particularly locums who don't necessarily um, have a, a fixed position in a practice, uh, and and the volume of primary care work has reduced considerably of the non-COVID uh, work. Uh, so it, it financially in New Zealand, it's, it, it's certainly been having, it's having an ongoing impact, but I think uh, Bob might be able to answer, Bob, Bob uh, Phillips might, and Andrew might be able to answer more for the United States, where I think things are a lot more dire. Hmm. Bob, would you uh, like to do? Yeah. Sure, thank you, Anna. I, in the United States, the uh, you know, the response to the Green Center survey suggests that up to 10% of the practices are uh, not going to be able to keep their doors open. Uh, the majority have laid off some staff or made other uh, accommodations, such as taking reduced pay. Um, our concern is that the practices that this is most likely to affect are the small and independent practices, our rural practices, and that as, uh, you know, the subsequent waves of COVID-19 happen, that they won't be there to take care of their populations and they're often the only providers in those areas. And the second problem we see is that we're starting to realize a lot of those patients with chronic multimorbid conditions who have not been attended to for some time now, uh, many of whom are coming back to our practices in worse shape than they left, um, also won't have that resource in their communities. Uh, so I think to a point that was made earlier, we may see a, a rise in non-COVID related deaths uh, if that infrastructure is put in too much jeopardy. It's a, it's a complex, uh, complex issue. I mean, we are dealing with complex uh, issues here. Welcome Donald Lee, he just joined us. Good to see you. We are, as you can hear, in the middle of discussions. Um, there's a comment from Spain, Jose Miguel Bueno. Uh, to the to the um, financial impact uh, on chat in Spain, most of us are civil servants, so we are salaried. There is no risk of bankruptcy. Only the government could decrease our salaries. 
So that's, uh, that's of course, another solution. Another reflection, that this goes to, again, to all panelists before we move on. Um, the combination of a rather high average age of family doctors in many countries. The risk of being um, infected with corona and the introduction of telehealth in large scale. Do any of you have any reflection on what we're seeing that GPs are or family doctors are retiring, that they're pulling back from several reasons in, the, in this situation? That's another question coming up here. Anyone who wants to respond to that? What are we seeing in the workforce of family doctors? When we first went into lockdown in New Zealand and we were worried that there was going to be a very large number of, um, of cases overwhelming our health system, our medical council invited um, uh, doctors who'd, who'd recently retired and nurses if they would like to get back on the medical register. And um, we had a very large number of people who, who, who quickly signed up and said they'd help. Um, either with contact or non-contact duties. And in actual fact, most of them haven't been needed. But, uh, but uh, we, certainly, we certainly didn't see people resigning. Um, but, but it may well be that the working conditions in the future become too difficult um, with the financial situation. Uh, that's, that's, that, that, that's another issue. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move on. It's now my pleasure to introduce another past president of Hong Kong, um, Chris van Biel. He will tell us about his recent research in the Netherlands. Um, please, Chris. Thank you, Anna, and welcome to all of you. And I'm happy to contribute to this uh, webinar, as you may see on your face, on my face, on your camera. Uh, this, the green that is sticking to me is probably uh, what's happening to you when there's too much Wonka in your life. Wonka green is sticking on you. Um, I'm happy to share with you some the uh, first results of an early study we did in the network. Uh, and Harris, may you move to the next slide uh, from our previous department at Radboud University, the PBRN. Uh, that's working there and that is part of the Dutch regular health system so it is playing the, uh, uh, the first point of contact for, for patients and it's a network that for a long time is recording all presented episodes of care using ICPCD, Wonka classification. Um, in the Netherlands the epidemic struck at the last days of February, uh, which was a weekend. Uh, in that, at that time, the Dutch College had already put up a regular uh, updating of practices of what would be installed the moment COVID-19 would arrive. And from the Monday of the first days of March, the network in fact introduced uh, an additional code within the ICPC to record any presentations related to COVID-19. That would be either confirmed diagnosis or suspected, suspected diagnosis or reasons for patients to contact, concerns of patients, worries. And what uh, I present has already been published in the uh, as a paper going prior to uh, peer review in the Annals of Family Medicine COVID collection. So for more details, you can look there. And Harris, please move to the next slide. Uh, this is mainly what we found. On the one hand, what we did see was a very sharp decrease in regular care. You could see it here for diabetes for depression, so physical, mental health problems, a sharp decline in preventive activities on the one hand, and on the other hand, we saw a sharp 
increase immediately in number of respiratory symptoms presented much more than in the previous time the year before and covid related problems became one of the most common presented issues uh, this issue has already been alluded to in the previous uh, presentations but i think this is interesting to look at or a, a number of uh, for a number of reasons the first one is that the effects as we recorded it were instantaneous it was not a development in the course of a week or, or the month it was more or less there in the very first week of march as you can see the dark issues on the uh, uh, the, on, for diabetes, depression, and prevention, are the uh, contacts that were based on telephone, email, uh, internet, and in regular care already, some of the care was done that way rather than depending on uh, patients actually visiting the practice. But the change, again, in the first week of March was immediate. There was an immense uh, activation of distance contacts. Part of it is very positive because the decrease provided the possibility for practices to realign their way of practice. But more important, I think, it's, it is a very negative part you see a loss of care in primary care for the most important health issues other than COVID. And this happened despite the fact that the Dutch College in the first week of March was in the eight o'clock news, urging patients to make sure that they would use primary care in a, a, a rational way that it would make, uh, 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 would acknowledge the fact that other issues than COVID would require functioning primary care. There was a very strong appeal from the Dutch College to continue regular care. Yet, what we see here is what how the public responded. And practices ever since we've been trying to restore contact with patients with chronic health problems. The data show that these efforts have been only in, uh, come to a limited amount of success. And if we move to the next slide, and I think this is one of the most important learning points for, for future uh, pandemics, uh, the fact that so quickly we use we lose contact with patients in regular care and probably one of the learning points is how can we manage to do that better in future uh, situations at the same time what the effects in primary care were and i think it's it's not that much of difference with with other countries what we did see in primary care with a high creativity in how practices could rearrange their practice. Uh, there was a, this very quick change from in-person to distance contacts. Um, practices were able to, uh, to, to, to segregate uh, patient flows with COVID and non-COVID problems by uh, having different uh, consulting hours or different practice locations and throughout the epidemic we've seen a leading role of the Dutch College in supporting evidence to primary care, to general practice, to the public on how to use primary care. Much more problematic has been the interaction between primary care and hospital care. Uh, although we have a uh, well-functioning state institute for population health that gives guidance and that collaborates with primary care we've seen a single focus on hospital care the most dramatic way 
is that for at least eight weeks, the eight o'clock news opened with the situation in intensive care and the number of places available and the struggle to get enough uh, uh, places in hospitals for intensive care for patients, how they were managing to do that without any reflection on the fact that the large majority of patients with COVID were not treated in hospitals, but they treated in primary care. With that also came a very uh, single focus on access to testing, to hospitals, access to protective gears. Most of primary care had to do without testing. Most of primary care, and particularly uh, nursing homes, had to do without testing and without protective gears. And again, that is one of the most important learning points of preparing primary care for a next uh, 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 epi epidemic. Uh, Harris, what is the next slide to move to? I think that these were my slides. And I think that the learning point we have to take is how immediate the, uh, the impact of an epidemic is, even where primary care is well prepared for it, and how quickly we use, we lose contact with patients, uh, even though primary care has been open and fully functioning and actively engaging with patients throughout the period, but particularly when the public information and uh, the, the, the eight o'clock news is the best, best example, is, has a single focus on hospitals. That is an implicit health education message to the public. Uh, and, um, well, I think that is the most common. And what we should realize is that COVID is the first pandemic we experience in populations where the large number of uh, elderly with chronic health problems, uh, the challenges we are facing for that is the new learning experience here. And some of our data give the first struggle with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you're really raising uh, a lot of interesting issues for an active practitioner. Uh, so <laughs> I have many questions to you, but I will, I will leave you with one or two. Um, we have neglected or, or we are losing contact with patients in need of chronic care. I think that's mm -hmm. an experience made in many countries. Yeah. Um, if we should look at what we call health literacy um, and to learn, I mean, into to next crisis, might be a pandemic, might be something else, um, a health crisis. Can you reflect a little bit on that? What, what, what is the role of health literacy? Are we, are we also neglecting that part? I mean, in between pandemics or crisis? Well, um, yes, of course. Of, of course, it, it, I suspect that the, the, the people we lose contact with are the people are, that are the most difficult to engage in the first place, mm -hmm. where it was probably the most uh, fragile and probably primary care at its very best that they were in contact and able to uh, engage these people in uh, inactive and proactive care. Um, is it the health literacy? I think it is at least as important as the personal uh, contact. And the importance, not just for the, for, for, the, for the practice, or not just for primary care as such, but the fact that that should be acknowledged uh, by, by, by public health, by, by, by the public the importance of that. And uh, we, we've given all sorts of, if you look back at it, difficult advices. We've, we've advised elderly people to stay home, to uh, abandon contacts with the outer world, to uh, abandon physical activities. Um, until February, when there was no COVID, the only advice we would give them was 
stay in touch with the rest of the world, be physically active. And no one realizes how poor a public health advice uh, that you don't specify uh, is because this will, 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 will change people's behavior, particularly of the people we've had such a big struggle in changing them into a more active, physically active, mental active lifestyle. Um, and I, I think that the challenge is, and it's not primary care, it's not hospital care, this is society. How do we give the very uh, uh, sound advice, uh, keep distance, uh, don't interact where you don't have to, because of a uh, pandemic and health risk coming from that, in a way that you not completely change people from active involvement uh, into people who are in complete isolation. And I think our, our data illustrate that that change is coming quickly rather than step by step. And that the, the damage is done if you don't do it in an appropriate way uh, early on. Thank you, Chris. A lot to discuss here. Um, we will move on. Um, the working parties, they, they, they want to tell you a little bit about some of the other activities uh, prior to COVID-19, which are still continuing. So I'll call on Bob Marsh from South Africa to tell us a little about the International Primary Healthcare Research Consortium. Please, Bob. Okay, thank you, uh, Anna. Uh, great, so just at the, the tail end of this webinar, just to inform you about this new initiative, the uh, Primary Healthcare Research Consortium. Uh, next slide. So this is, uh, as you can see, a very new uh, initiative. We, we met for the first time in February 2020 in Delhi. We, we managed to do this just before all of the uh, lockdowns and restrictions on, on travel. Um, and this consortium uh, was established by these particular organizations that you can see. Uh, so Wonka, uh, as represented by Felicity, is one of the founding members of this consortium. Uh, and then Prima Famed, which is a, a network of uh, departments of family medicine and primary care in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the George Institute in India and Australia. The International Center for Diarrheal Disease, which, which actually does primary health care research, not just diarrheal research in Bangladesh. Um, Ariadne Labs and George Washington University in the USA. And the American University of Beirut in, in the Lebanon. So this, this somewhat uh, eclectic group of organizations came together because they responded to a call prior to the establishment of the consortium uh, to, to look at what are the global uh, gaps in uh, research questions uh, around primary health care. So what, what are the key issues that research needs to address? Um, next slide. So uh, when we met in Delhi, we uh, collectively decided on our vision. And you can see that the vision is very much focused on low and middle income countries. And how do we strengthen primary health care in, in these particular countries through the consortium. Um, and the mission, as you can see, is uh, to develop, capacitate, um, conduct and disseminate LMIC-led research. Um, and I think you can see even from this webinar, you know, that you know, the, it, even within the world of primary care research, uh, you know, the, the capacity and the energy is still very much in the high income countries. So, so this is putting the focus very much on looking at what's happening in LMICs, how do we strengthen them, but how do we also get them to lead and to develop capacity. Um, so, and Oh, hang on. And beyond that, uh, to drive the research findings to action uh, by addressing priority knowledge gaps, engaging with policymakers and decision makers, and as it says, to catalyze that within this uh, consortium, the global network of partners that this consortium brings together. So Wonka obviously is a global network. Prima Famed is a network within Africa. The other organizations also bring in South America, Asia, 
and the Eastern Mediterranean. So collectively, there is a footprint across LMICs across the, um, across the globe. Thanks. Last slide. Um, so um, within the first two years, we, we had funding for, for two initial prioritized questions. And the, these first two uh, bullet points are the questions that we decided on. Uh, so sort of pre-COVID. Uh, so the first one is, uh, how are different low and middle income countries implementing uh, primary healthcare teams and integrating those teams to support the delivery of, actual, of more comprehensive primary health care. And this would be a mixed method study uh, in India, Uganda, and Brazil. And the second question that we focused on was how do these three uh, low-income countries, Malawi, El Salvador, and Lebanon, measure the performance of their primary health care systems at the moment at the organizational and whole system level, and how are they using that information to guide policy um, at a national level? level. Now clearly since we met in February, COVID-19 has sort of overtaken the, the consciousness of the world and we have started to get involved in some research that's COVID related. I think you saw that the research that Bob and Andrew presented earlier that the consortium was one of the supporting organizations to that. And we're now also looking at a study with uh, Penn State University to look more at how our communities, how is the public in different LMICs making sense of COVID-19 and what is their intention to comply with um, public health advice and how are they, um, what is their knowledge and, and yeah, how are, they, how are they intending to behave going forward. Yeah, I think that's my last point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, you are really raising important questions. And you say this is apart from COVID-19 COVID to call our attention now. But the questions and issues you are raising should be have high actuality also in the COVID-19 um, times. Driving research to action by addressing priority knowledge gaps. A wonderful sentence. Um, I think in respect of time, we will go on to the next speaker. Uh, and here's our last speaker. It's Mehmet Akman, our incoming working party chair. Over to you, Mehmet. Hi, uh, uh, thank you very much, Anna. Um, can I have this presentation? Yes, thank you. Uh, first. I would like to say that I'm very happy to be part of this working party and working together with uh, distinguished members in recent years. Uh, it's very clear that the working party on research achieved many of its targets under the leadership of Felicity, and some of them are already being mentioned in the previous talks. Uh, actually, Felicity, with her embracing attitude to everyone, set a higher standards during her chair. So taking over the chair from her is an honor, but also a challenge in terms of keeping up with her standards. Uh, so I will do my best actually to bring one step forward uh, the momentum realized during the last two terms as the incoming chair under the guidance of Felicity and also the Wonka executive and also with the contribution of other uh, working party members. It's very crucial for future development of primary care to generate its own evidence from its daily practice. So therefore building up the uh, research capacity is a continuous mission for family care medicine and working party will continue to contribute to this mission in future as it does today. Um, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce uh, myself brief briefly and also um, describe a little bit what is important for me uh, as a vision for a uh, working party on research. Uh, firstly, I am a professor of family medicine working at Marmara University of uh, Istanbul in, in Turkey. Well, uh, in this slide, uh, you might find it a little bit difficult to recognize me on the picture on the right, but you will probably have the similar experiences during the recent crisis. Uh, as primary care workers, we all looked alike in our protective personal equipments, and no matter what personal background we have, we all unite and again, uh, fight against the same enemy. So uh, despite this short video and fields of interest, uh, I was actually working as a COVID doctor, to be honest, for the last three months. 
um, and just looking exactly at this picture uh, at work. Um, but what I have done before, let me tell you briefly, uh, besides publishing many articles, I have also in, um, contributed some books. Uh, one of them is uh, International Perspectives on Primary Care Research, uh, which is edited by Felicity and Bob, also as a work of uh, working party on research. And my main research and work area in the last five years are mainly chronic diseases and their management in primary care health systems research with an emphasis on the efficient phase of strengthening primary care and organizing it according to current needs and global conditions. Um, also, I'm teaching medical humanities to undergraduates and using reflective techniques and arts during postgraduate training of family medicine residents. So medical humanities, uh, what we can learn from social sciences is another field of interest of mine. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see some of the projects I was involved uh, and also my membership to uh, different uh, primary care related organizations. Uh, one of the recent projects that uh, I have a coordinator role is the Primora project. Uh, the Primora is aiming to establish a primary care multi-professional research network and I'm assigned to write a position paper on organization of primary care under this project. Um, and I was involved in this as one of the representatives of EFPC, the European Forum for Primary Care. Um, in brief, what makes EFPC different than most of the primary care organizations is its multi-professional structure. And I have been advisory board member for six years there and also still very active member in this organization. And at the national level, uh, besides our national organization TAUT, uh, I'm involved in the declaration of a trust uh, for primary care called TAHEV, Turkish Family Medicine Foundation, and still a member of this uh, organization as a, a board of trustees. Next slide, please. So uh, as a last word, uh, I would like to talk about new book project of the working party. Uh, this will be the third book actually initiated by Felicity during her chairing, and it will be a sister book to How to Do Primary Care Research. Um, the title of the new book is A Practical Guide to Primary Care Educational Research this time, and the editors are myself, uh, Professor Val Vass, the chair of Wonka Working Party on Education, and uh, Professor Felicity goodyear Civit. Um, I'm very excited about this book, and I believe it will fill a gap of research and education, especially for primary care professionals. Um, the book will explore the scope of primary care educational research and the current research environment in the context of undergraduate education, postgraduate training, continuous professional development, and also the patient education. So it will address various issues like interprofessional education, uh, participatory research approaches, and building research capacity through mentoring. I would like to thank Wonka Executive for their support to this new book, and hopefully we will see it on shelves somewhere next year uh, as a new uh, Wonka publication. So this is actually the end of my very brief presentation. Uh, as a final remark, I would like to express my enthusiasm once more about the uh, Wonka Working Party on research. So I'm looking forward to seeing new projects coming from our members. And I also would like to invite everyone interested in primary care research to join the Working Party uh, if you are not already a member. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mehmet, and, and good luck on, on future tasks um, as chair of, of the Working Party. Thank Panelists, you. we are we are nearing the end now of this session. Um, I'll just give you a few um, few comments from the chat. First of all, you know that there is enthusiasm, gratitude, um, admiration from from attendees um, because of the work you are doing. There is also an interest of being included in the service in the future service, right? Uh, like I will read to you, one, one participant says on, on Facebook, um, the challenges we are facing seems to be the same all over the world. We should enhance what's good or bad and Wonka should reflect in such a survey during the next month, let's say. Otherwise, we might not prove 
the family care really seems to be the front line and the way this pandemic changed our practice. Okay, from, from, uh, from the front line, a comment from the front line. A question to all of you, maybe, maybe Mehmet, uh, you, you, you should go first on, on that one. How can we engage more young family doctors in research? Yes, yeah, uh, it is a very uh, challenging question. Uh, well, uh, what I uh, find that's helpful when I'm mentoring uh, uh, young doctors in my um, institution is to um, make link between research and then the uh, daily practice. So one can think that if I will be a family doctor and work in my practice, why should I be interested in research and why I learn it? But well, actually, first of all, you need to learn it to critically apprise the literature. And secondly, I mean, uh, for the development of primary care, we need primary care data and we need primary care researchers. So it's very uh, difficult to have development in primary care with research from secondary care. So at least, I mean, uh, it would be uh, great for them to uh, add uh, data collection uh, so uh, I'm just trying to make these links with the daily practice uh, and this helps a little bit uh, uh, to get more involved in research. Thank you very much. I will now um, end this part of the session. Uh, thank you all, uh, attendees on the chat, on Facebook, panelists for interesting presentations. There are a lot of hang it, lo loose threads here to, to pick up and discuss and I'm happy to, to, to see that. So Donald, you're with us and you will now give some concluding remarks. Yes, thank you panelists for leading a wonderful presentation and sharing with us interesting surveys and research. And I'm also quite excited to hear about the future plans of networking, new research networks and also publications. The first series of eight, the eight Wonka webinars come to an end tonight. I hope you have found them informative. We'll be taking a little time to organize the next series of webinars to watch out for our advertisement. <clears throat> we will continue, but we want maybe better organization and better focus in topics. So I wish to conclude by saying, COVID-19 is a pandemic with an unknown end game. I wish each and every one of our family doctors well during this time. Use the best advice available. Work collaboratively with your teams. Do the best you can for your patients. You should stand proud of your contribution to tackling this world crisis. No one knows what we will face in the weeks and months ahead, but everyone knows enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our own interests. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Donald, and thanks to Felicity and all of the panel for a really excellent and interesting presentation. Um, as Donald has said, this is the last in the current series. However, we are discussing plans for the future. So watch this space for future events. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. And a special thanks to Harris Lejudakis, our CEO designate, for his magical technical skills. Take care, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed.